He wants to use my mouth. He has put me in charge over this world. He has ordained it in such a way that whatever I speak will come to pass. So I'm going to speak it and it will come to pass. So the man speaks with that confidence that whatever he says will come to pass. Singing I love you, Lord. Singing I love you, Lord. Singing I love you, oh Lord, I love you. Hebrews chapter 4, let me read to you verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. We are teaching about our confession. Christianity, the reformer said, is a great confession. Christianity itself is a great confession. Why? Not because we confess sins. Confession of sin is only a small part of Christianity. When we sin, we confess sins. It's important to do that because sin gets in the way of our fellowship with God. But we don't always go around saying we are sinners and we are nothing. We are dust and a worm and all that. That's a negative confession. The Bible never teaches us to do that. Someone has taught people like that, I think, around here and in many parts of the world. Somebody has conveyed this kind of a thing that you must always go to God saying, I'm a sinner, I'm unworthy, I'm nothing but dust, I'm worm and no good and so on. So some people just out of the, out of the practice they've had in it a long time, they just say it uh, and they keep on saying it from one generation to generation, uh, from generation to generation and that is negative confession 
and I told you that that is not necessary. The Bible is not about, I mean, Christianity is not about that negative confession. Christianity is about a positive confession. Positive confession is, is a confession of what we believe. It's our confession of our faith. It is what you believe concerning Jesus Christ, who He is and what He has done, and what you become as a result, what God can do through you, what you can do through God who is in you, and so on. It is a confession of our faith. So Christianity is a great confession because in Christianity, the thing that is most important is that we are a people who confess what we believe. It is not once in a while us confessing of our sins or something when we sin. Always we have a confession in our mouth. When we are singing, we are confessing, confessing something. When we are talking, we are confessing something. We speak what we believe. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, he says, We having the same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore we speak. We are the believe, believing and speaking kind. And we are the kind that speak what we believe. That's the kind of people we are. We believe something and we speak that thing. That's the, kind, that's the spirit of faith. So we've been talking about our faith and our confession. What is our confession? You can identify this confession. We must hold fast to that confession. We must stand on that confession and must not waver. Now, we've been looking at it and I, I've been identifying for you what our confession is, this positive confession is. God created everything by speaking. He said, and it was so. God said, let there be light. Beginning from that, God always speaks, and it comes to pass. He's, a, he's the kind of God that speaks and brings things into being. Then he made man, and made man in his image and likeness, so that he also speaks and brings things into being. After he made man, God hasn't changed his method. His method is still the same. The mode is a little different because before man was there, God had to speak directly into this world, light. He said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, when God wants done something in this world, He always speaks through a man. God speaks, but He always speaks through a man. And that is why we have so many prophets in the Old Testament. And they always rise up and say, thus saith the Lord God. They come into the midst of a situation in the midst of a confusion, warring times and, and difficult times and so on, God raises up a prophet, gives him the word to speak, and he speaks the word, and whatever he says comes to pass. God has ordained it like that. He, God never does anything without first speaking it. You see the birth of Jesus Christ, the suffering of Jesus, the death, the resurrection, everything is spoken already. Hundreds of years before he came, it was all spoken by a prophet. He first sends his word, then only... What his word said happens. This is God's pattern. But after man was made, God never speaks directly out into the world to do something. In order to do anything into the, in this world, God speaks through a man because God has ma made man as the head over all things, all of his creation. Therefore, after man was made, God always speaks through a man when he wants to do anything. That is why we have so many prophets. And that is why when a man speaks also, he can speak like God, so that not one thing that he says fails. About so many people, the prophets of Old Testament times, it is said like that. And I showed you, there are so many prophets in the Old Testament, and the last and the greatest of the Old Testament prophet, Jesus said, is John the Baptist, the greatest among the Old, Test Old Covenant prophets. But the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. That is one of us in the new covenant after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. The ones we live up, uh, that live after that. The least among us is greater than the greatest old covenant prophet. <laughs> How can we be greater? Because in the old covenant, only a few prophets had the anointing. The word of the Lord came only to one or two people in the nation. Everyone else had to go to them and inquire from them what the Lord is saying. They were dependent upon that one or two prophets. In the new covenant, the Holy Spirit has come to dwell in each one of us, which they did never had. The least believer in the new covenant is more blessed than the old covenant prophets because the Holy Spirit is now coming and dwelling in that believer. 
So you yourself are a, literally a prophet over your life. This is what, this is the point I made. You are yourself a prophet over your life. And what you speak, you are supposed to speak. Take the promises of God's word. The word of God is given to you for you to take and speak. God has sent his word. God has spoken his word already. But he requires that you and I take the promises of God and speak his word into our situations. Now let me show you how this will work. It will work just as well as it worked in the old covenant. Under the old covenant, where there was only few prophets who were anointed, it worked very well. It should work very well under the new covenant. It's a better covenant with better promises. How well did it work under the old covenant? I'll show you. Take these verse 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 56. Solomon just finished praying the prayer. And, uh, and after he finished the prayer, he is now pronouncing a benediction over people. What is a benediction? Bene is good, diction is word. He is saying some good words over the people. He is now beginning to speak over the people some blessings. When a pastor pronounces benediction, he is speaking some good words. And that is, this is what he's saying. Look at verse 56. Blessed be the Lord who has given, a, given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. Now notice the word promised. How important promises of God are. God has given rest to his people, of his, uh, to his people Israel according to all that he promised. There has not failed one word of all his good promise which he promised through his servant Moses. What a significant statement. He says, there has not failed one word of all his good promises which he promised through his servant Moses. In other words, whatever God promised through Moses, see, God always promises through somebody, right? God didn't speak out from heaven right into the earth. He spoke through a man, Moses. Whatever God promised through Moses, it's always through somebody, through a man. It has to be that way. That's why we have so many prophets and so on. Whatever God said through Moses, the promises through Moses, not one word failed. Not one word failed. Not one failure, 100% result. Everything that Moses as a prophet said came to pass. Nothing failed. Now, I want to remind you that this is something that Solomon says 500 years after Moses spoke those promises. 500 years, my friend. This is not a short-term uh, success we're talking about. He says, in the last 500 years, everything that God has said, whatever God promised Moses, God promised Moses that he will give the people rest. That is, that, they, that their, their enemies will be defeated. That they will rest. They will have rest and peace and prosperity. And whatever God promised, he brought it to pass. Not one single word failed. 500 years later, he says that. What a tremendous statement. But this is not the only place. Notice how well the Bible emphasizes it. Joshua chapter 21, 43. So the Lord gave to Israel all the land of which he had sown to give to their fathers. And they took possession of it and dwelt in it. Now, God had sown certain things, promised certain things, that they'll, he will give them certain land and so on, the promised land. And they took possession of it and they dwelt in it. The promises came to pass, he says. The Lord gave them rest all around, according to all that he had sown to their fathers. And not a man of all their enemies stood against them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. Even when Joshua took over after Moses, God promised him in the first chapter itself, not one man will raise his finger against you, God said to Joshua. One man will not be able to raise. Not even one fellow will be able to raise his finger against you. I'll give you success, he said. And Joshua now says, God has fulfilled that. He has brought that to pass, he says. Now listen. Verse 45, not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. Again and again, not a word failed. Not one word failed. Everything came to pass, he says. Everything that God had spoken, 
God did. Everything God said to Moses, everything God said to me, God has done, he says. Eh? Chapter 23 and verse 14 of Joshua. Now, Joshua, if you read the first verse, it says Joshua was old and advanced in age. And uh, a long time after the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their enemies round about, that Joshua was old and advanced in age. And now he's ready to go home. I mean, he's ready to die just like all men die when they get old. He's speaking in his old age. And look at what he says, verse 14. Behold this day, I'm going the way of all the earth. Whatever is happening to everybody is happening to me, he says. I'm getting old, I'm going to die. And you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one word of them has failed. What a testimony toward the end of his life. You ask Joshua, Joshua, what do you think about God? Can you trust his word? Can you believe something when God says? Can you believe his promises? Can you stand on his promises? Would he bring it to pass? Joshua would say to you, I lived a long life. I became old. I can testify to you. God will never fail. Not one word, not one promise will fail. Every promise will come to pass. Every pro prophet, the prophet speaks with the confidence that God will bring it to pass. I'm just supposed to speak it, that's all. The one who brings it to pass is God. So prophets always speak with this confidence when they speak. They, they believe that God has said this, therefore I'm going to speak it. And I'm supposed to just speak it. He's the one that says it. I, he wants to use my mouth. He has put me in charge over this world. He has ordained it in such a way that whatever I speak will come to pass. So I'm going to speak it and it will come to pass. So the man speaks with that confidence that whatever he says will come to pass. And not one word, not one single word failed. Toward the end of his life, he says, after a long life. Now, this man has been there a long time. He came from slavery of Egypt through the journey in wilderness. He took over after Moses died and led the people into the land of Canaan, into the possession of all their inheritance. He's got wonderful experiences. What's your experience? He says, I'll tell you what God is all about. If he speaks, you better listen, believe, because everything he said, he brings to pass. Amen? Another verse. This is so important. I just want to read to you as many as possible. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 10 and verse 10. Know that nothing shall fall to the earth of the word of the Lord, which the Lord spoke concerning the house of Ahab. For the Lord has done what he spoke by his servant Elijah. In other words, he says, whatever God spoke through Elijah the prophet about Ahab, everything he said he has brought to pass, he says. You remember Elijah went to, walked into Ahab's palace one day and said, listen, I am telling you because the Lord is saying this, it will not rain hereafter. And until I say again, it will not rain, he says. He says, I'm the authority. God told me to tell you, rain, it will stop raining now. And until I come back again and tell you it's going to rain, it will not rain. The years will go by, it will not rain, he says. And it happened exactly like that. <laughs> exactly like that. Now, one more verse. <laughs> Turn to 1 Samuel, chapter 3, verse 19. Samuel grew. You know Samuel the prophet, right? How from his childhood God had chosen him and uh, used him. And the Lord was with him and let, none, and let none of his words fall to the ground. God did not let none of his words fall to the ground. What an amazing statement. Not one word from Samuel ever fell to the ground. God literally fulfilled everything that God had spoken through Samuel, the prophet, you know. Everything, everything that he had said, he fulfilled it through the prophet Samuel. All right. Now, these are the prophets. But what I'm saying is, in the new covenant, that kind of a privilege, the kind of privilege that we're talking about here, that you can speak and 100% of it will come to pass. That kind of privilege is given to every single believer. 
the new covenant is a better covenant. Under the old covenant, the Holy Spirit only came upon some people at some times and used them and spoke through them. So they said, thus says the Lord. And every time they spoke like that, it came to pass. But we have the thus says the Lord here, the word of God with the precious promises of God. The promises of God are called precious promises because the promises of God are unlike any promise made on this earth. We hear promises all the time. We'll do this, we'll do that. Promises and more promises. But the Bible promises are different. When someone makes a promise, they are not called precious promise. They are seasonal promises. <laughs> Sometimes they mean well, but they can't do it. They are unable to do it. Some of these men, they make it in, with good intentions, you know. They want to do this, they want to do that. And when that, but then they get into some kind of a jam and they, they cannot get out of it. And they cannot do what they said they will do. Some of them make promises knowing that they won't be able to do it. You can tell by the way they make the promises, they will never be able to do it. You can't do that. But they'll say, we'll do it. Because they just want to say this and gain some power or something. But they'll never be able to do it. Knowing that they'll tell you that. But they're not, that's why they're not precious promises. Whether they're well-intentioned or bad people just promising false things, you know, because they cannot bring it to pass, those promises cannot be called the precious promises. But the Bible promises are called precious because of the nature of the promise. God is making it. He is able. He will never come back to you and tell you, sorry, excuse me, I didn't have the majority, so I couldn't do it. <laughs> he doesn't need any majority. He is the majority by himself. He will do it. He doesn't need anybody's help. He will do it. So whatever he promises, he will do it. God is never going to come back to you and, uh, you know, tell you, give you excuses for his failure. God is able to do it. That's why Jeremiah 1.12, which we read last week, is important. I will hasten to perform my word, God says. God watches over his word to perform it. That means he's careful. He wants to perform it. One word will not be wasted. One word will not fail. He's watching over his word. That's the way God is because he can do it and he wants to do it. He's eager to do it. He's not delaying it. He's in a hurry to do it. He wants to do it. So God's promises are precious promises. That's why 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, Paul Peter talks about how God has given us precious promises. I love that expression, precious promises. God's promises are precious because they never fail. That's why it's precious. Not one word will fail from God's promise. That is why they are precious. The blood of Jesus is precious because no blood can do what the blood of Jesus can do. No blood can wash away your sin. We sing, what can wash away your sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's why it's precious. When something is precious, there is something very special about it. The special nature of God's word is that not one single word will fail. That's the way God's word is. Amen. Yeah, thanks be to God who always comes in.
is us Try your friends hey, thanks Clap our hands and sing Thanks be to God We have overcome Hallelujah Hallelujah We have overcome By the power of your name Jesus you're the You're the one.